Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Scroll Saw Corner. Today I'm going to take you through a project that I designed. Oftentimes when you're playing tabletop role-playing games, you're going to have a lot of dice rolling involved. And you may be playing on a table that is finished, like your dining room table, or something that you don't want to damage. People also like to use fancy dice, metal dice or heavier ones, and they can put dings and dents in the table. So dice trays are a way to keep it all contained and keep them from damaging the work surfaces. I designed this one with simple box joint style joinery, and I made it out of quarter inch mahogany. You can find the pattern at scrollsawcorner.com and feel free to use it and share it as long as you attribute it to me and Scroll Saw Corner. Thanks and enjoy. I designed this project in AutoCAD Fusion 360. Fusion 360 is a nice, uh, fairly full-featured three-dimensional CAD program, and I've used it, I wouldn't say extensively, but uh, quite a bit. I started with uh, the concept of just the basic dice tray with a section for storing the dice and worked away to what type of joinery could I do and how would I fit the pieces together, how would I cut it out, and what size would it need to be so that I could print the pattern on a single sheet of paper and I came up with this. As I mentioned earlier the pattern is available at scrollsawcorner.com and all you need to do is print the pages out, affix it to your stock, I used quarter inch stock, and cut away. My typical method of pattern application is to use blue painter's tape on the stock and then 3M Super 77 spray adhesive on the back of the pattern and then after waiting a few, maybe a moment or two for it to get tacky, smooth it out onto the painter's tape on top of the stock. I like to do this because I feel like it makes removing the pattern easy after it's complete. Other people use uh, contact paper and shelf liners. Some people even use spray adhesive or glue sticks directly onto the pattern to it, affix it directly to the wood. This is the way that I do it and the way that I was shown, and it's worked well for me for about three years. So I continue to do it. For this project, I used number three and number five Olsen Precision Ground Teeth Blades. As usual, I'm going to start with the inside cuts. So I cut out the open mortises on the base plate here and then the side pieces later when I get to those. And I feel it's easier to cut out your inside pieces so you have a larger workpiece to hold on to while you're cutting. Something that you'll see me do from time to time, uh, like you see me doing here for this pattern, is I will put all the pieces on a larger board and then break it up into smaller chunks so it's easier to manipulate, and that's what I'm doing here. Doing long straight cuts on the scroll saw can be a challenge, but if you're going to do boxes or plaques or different types of patterns like these, you'll often find that you're going to have to do some of them on the scroll saw. You could cut the pieces out on the table saw, but again, this is a scroll saw channel, so we're going to do it with the scroll saw here. I wanted to design a pattern and a project that could be done entirely on the scroll saw, and this one is a good way to practice doing those long straight cuts, and that'll be helpful for making other more complicated boxes later on. Something that continues to be a challenge for me as a content creator is getting a good view of the cutting action without interfering with the work that I'm doing. And my blower tends to cause that problem. Uh, it's situated on the opposite side of the scroll saw, and I'm right-handed, so you uh, tend to see me manipulating the blower or trying to change my hand position so that all the viewers can see exactly what I'm doing without uh, much blockage. So if you have any suggestions or feedback, I've gotten some great feedback from viewers before and I continue to like to receive it. So please share if you have any thoughts. Something that wasn't really first nature 
for me when I started scroll sawing was what you see me doing throughout this pattern, which is sort of starting and stopping my cutting along the outlines. At least for me, the first thought was to just cut the entire pattern out like you were tracing it with a pencil. But uh, you'll find that even with the finest blades in some situations, you don't get very sharp corners and it can be difficult to keep the shape you want. So as you see me doing here, consider different ways to enter the workpiece and begin your cutting. You can end up with much cleaner corners and straighter lines this way. You know, the waste material is just that. It's trash. So use it however you need to to give yourself the optimum cut. You'll see me here bypassing some different areas and then re-entering later on. Um, I did most of this cutting with the number five, but some of the corners I came back in with the number three, so where I thought I could get a cleaner corner. Now we'll talk a little bit about finishing. I'm not going to show the steps for finishing in this because I think that's kind of secondary to the nature of this project. You could finish it in a variety of different ways depending on what type of wood you use. If you used Baltic birch plywood or another plywood, you might want to paint it. Um, if you used a simple wood like pine or something that's not a attractive hardwood, you may want to stain it. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail on that, but I will tell you what I did. I started the finishing process, as I often do when I'm not doing intarsia or segmentation, by sanding the workpiece, my stock, to 220 grit before actually putting the pattern down. And I did this because once you start cutting and assembling, it can be more challenging to get a good quick sand in than it is if you just do it before you start. So on projects where I'm going to be doing fret work or a box on a scroll saw or something like that, I will typically sand to 220 before I even start doing the cutting. After sanding and applying the pattern and doing all of the cutting, I went back and I applied a boiled linseed oil and I did this one coat and I waited about 24 hours for it to dry as much as possible before applying a paste wax finish. I really like paste wax on something that I'm going to be using and handling, something small like this, because I think it, get, I think it gives a great smooth satin finish that's very easily touched up. I use paste wax on a lot of things in my wood shop, whether it's my cast iron surfaces or on small projects, and I highly recommend it. I typically use the uh, SC Johnson paste wax, but I'm sure that the other brands would be just fine. As we're approaching the end of the cutting here, I'll now talk a little bit about the final assembly process. Those who follow me on Instagram probably saw the post where I showed the dry fit and rolling some dice in it. And I was pretty happy with it because uh, after cutting, I did the dry fit and the whole thing fit together with uh, minimal persuasion. I ended up taking a sharp chisel and cleaning up some of the joints a little bit and some of the long cut edges because there were some humps here and there where I didn't cut perfectly straight. It looks pretty good in the video, and I think I did a fairly good job overall, but you'll see uh, if you do this project yourself, there may be some areas where you need to touch it up a little bit. And I think uh, a good sharp chisel or maybe a small uh, block plane can help you out there. There you have it. This one took about 45 minutes to cut out and uh, it was fairly simple overall. I hope you enjoyed the video today and if you make this project or any of the others, please post it and tag me in it on Instagram at scrollsawcorner or share it with me on my website, scrollsawcorner.com. Thanks, have a great day.